Hi there, and welcome. Have you ever found that when something is too good to be true, it usually is, it usually doesn't live up to the promise? Well, today's topic is not that. Pastor Jacob is going to guide us through our next presentation entitled, Too Good to Be True. Wherever you are, you'll want to sit down for this one and tune in. Make yourself comfortable as Pastor Jacob presents right after this song. Now we will sing in Christ alone. Please sing with us. In Christ alone, my hope is found. My name is Rod and uh, I'd like to just have a prayer before we start to today's talk. Heavenly Father, tonight, until today, we pray that you'll please bless the time that we spend listening to what Jacob has prepared for us. Please, Lord, give him words to speak that will be something that we'll in enjoy and understand. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a well-known children's song that talks about how the different bones in the body are connected. It's called the skeleton song. In your groups, finish the statements uh, for me. The toe bones connected to the foot bone. The foot bones connected to the ankle bone. The ankle bones connected to the leg bone. The leg bones connected to the knee bone, the knee bones connected to the thigh bone, the thigh bones connected to the hip bone, 
the hip bones connected to the back bone. The back bones connected to the neck bone. The neck bones connected to the head bone. And there's another verse. The finger bones are connected to the hand bone. The hand bones connected to the arm bone. The arm bones connected to the shoulder bone. And I believe that's the rest of the song. How many did you get? Hopefully you're able to talk it out with me. You wouldn't want to hear my singing. But the message from that song is very clear. The whole body is very much interconnected. And particularly when one bone suffers, the rest of the body is going to feel it because of how connected it is. And today we're looking into a topic that is foundational in understanding the rest of this series. It's the topic of what happens when we die. If we don't grasp or fully understand what happens when we die, many aspects of the Christian faith will not make sense and, we can contra- and the beliefs contradict each other. Whatever it is that you may believe, regardless whether you're a Christian or non-Christian, I hope that whatever it is you believe is logical. Particularly for faith, any belief about God, for it to be true, there must be a clear logic and sound reason for it. For contradictions create confusion and it doesn't paint an accurate picture of who God is. So let's explore what the Bible says about what happens when we die. And look, I can summarise death for you in one word. You ready for it? The word is sleep. Sleep. A common belief in many Christian faiths is that upon death, one goes to heaven. However, stay with me and let's consider a different perspective together. In the book of Ecclesiastes, in the Bible, the writer observes that everyone faces the same fate, which can lead to a sense of hopelessness. The living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward, nor are they remembered. When we die, we enter into sleep. And when you're asleep, you don't know anything. You close your eyes. Yes, you're still breathing. But you do not know what is happening around you. There is darkness. And before you know it, your alarm clock is going off. Or you have your mum or dad or husband or wife going, get up. It is time to get up. And meanwhile, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, maybe 12 hours have past. Let me provide for you an example that death is asleep. Jesus was asked one day by a man named Jairus to heal his daughter. His daughter was very, very sick and he believed that Jesus could heal her. Jesus agreed to come and heal this little girl who was 12 years old. Along the way, to the house, there's a crowd and there's a multitude of people who are surrounding Jesus and he cannot move very quickly at all. It's very slow pace. And all of them are trying to get as close as they can to Jesus. And during that time, as Jesus, Jesus heals a lady who, had, who was also unwell, who had been bleeding for 12 years. And we don't have time for that story today, but the two stories intertwined. But just after Jesus had healed this lady, Jairus receives word that his daughter had died. Jesus continues to walk towards Jairus' house. The multitude leaves. And as Jesus comes to the front of the house, there is people pretending to mourn and wail with great loudness, creating an atmosphere of sadness because someone had died. And when Jesus got there, he said, when he came in, He said to them, why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. 
But when he had put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which is translated little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age and they were overcome with great amazement. Jesus makes it very clear in that story that death is a sleep. A man named Job puts it in a very good way, time before Jesus. But when people die, their strength is gone. They breathe their last, and then where are they? As water evaporates from a lake and a river disappears in drought, people are laid to rest and do not rise again. Until the heavens are no more, they will not wake up nor be roused from their sleep. Does anything actually happen when you die? Well, let me give you two things that happen when you die. And each of these is found within the Bible of God's word. Firstly, return to dust. Not long after Adam and Eve, the first humans, ate the fruit which they weren't meant to eat, God told them, for you were made from dust and to dust you will return. A reminder in our previous presentations, we mentioned that there were two deaths and the death that we're talking about now is the first death. This reinforces the idea that death is a natural part of life, a return to our original state. And when a burial happens, it's a very good visual representation of someone returning to the dust. And secondly, what happens when I die? The spirit returns to God. The author of Ecclesiastes says, For then the dust will return to the earth and the spirit will return to the God who gave it. And this text would have been written within the Hebrew originally. And the word here is for spirit means breath. And in our first presentation, we mentioned that God breathed into man's nostrils. The man became a living being because of the breath of of God. We are alive because God's breath has been breathed into us. There's much more to life than just us living for ourselves. So when we die, that breath that was breathed into us returns to God who gave it. There's still a state of unconsciousness. There is no life now within that human being. There is no immediate afterlife experience which is often assumed. And whilst it is nice to think that someone is in heaven after they die because they've been somewhat as a good person, there are serious problems that can contradict beliefs. Let me provide two of them for you. Firstly, If we believe that we go to heaven when we die, the death and resurrection of Jesus means nothing. And in our previous presentation, we said that the death and resurrection of Jesus means absolutely everything. He has made a way for us to be with God for eternity. And if we believe that we go to heaven to be with God when we die, then there was no reason for Jesus to come and die because there was already a way that had been made. Jesus came because there was no way, because there was nothing beyond the grave. There was no future. There was no hope. Jesus was the one who made the way. And if we believe we go to heaven because we're just a we consider it as a good person, rather than believing in what Jesus has done, the sacrifice for us in making a way, his sacrifice just becomes another event in history rather than the pivotal moment that offers hope for eternal life. 
we then believe that we can get to heaven based on our own strength, our own merits, our own morals, if you will, which is impossible. Jesus is just then another human being who just died and there's nothing significant going on. The experience of Jesus here on earth in his death, he was falsely accused. There was a crown in his head. There were temptations. He's gone through a whole lot. And I'm sure he never really wanted to go through the experience, but he did because he believed that what he was doing had meaning and would shape or change history. It would change, as we've said, he's the game changer. It would change the human experience forever. Secondly, God has made it clear that the consequences of sin is death. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Though Jesus has defeated death and victory is his, sin is still in this world. God has said that he is a just God. His justice, though, would not be seen if he took people from living through the consequences of sin. Sin separates us from God and death is the agency of how that separation happens. God wants us to know how bad sin is. He wants us to know how bad our selfishness and how bad our pride is. It teaches us who are alive, who have lost a loved one, who just how bad it is, the heartbreak. It's more than just us enjoying things that we want to enjoy, more than just doing things that satisfy us. It also reveals the love of Jesus and what he has done for us. And that is why we can live with hope, knowing that one day sin will be wiped away. It will be eradicated. It will be gone for eternity. And there are many more implications and we'll actually discover in our remaining presentations the implications for truly understanding of what happens when we die. There's also a popular belief that people are able to communicate with the dead. And God gives a very stern warning to the people of Israel about this kind of thing. These people were to show that they were different. And God says to them, do not defile yourselves by turning to mediums or to those who consult with the spirits of the dead. What this presents to me is that there is a clear conflict happening in this world. From the beginning, God has said that this is the way it's going to be because of the choices you have made. But the enemy of God contradicts absolutely everything that God says. And so when God says that the dead cannot know nothing, the enemy of God will find a way to be able for the dead to communicate with God. The living, you and I are engaged in this conflict and the decision as to whether we choose to say yes to God, I trust that you know what is best and I will live my life according to that or no, I won't accept God, whatever happens within this life. Talking about the hope that I mentioned earlier, John, who lived during the time of Jesus, records Jesus saying, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Friends, this is the second death. It is possible to not die the second death, and that is by accepting what Jesus has done on the cross. And this promise reinforces the hope of the resurrection and the eternal life for those who believe, those who live their lives for God. God longs to be with you and me, but it cannot happen straight away. God is waiting for people who have not decided to either follow him or reject him. He is waiting so that he can have as many as he can in heaven. 
But time is running out. And God wants to be with you. Yes, yes, there is a waiting involved. But will you take this opportunity to say, I choose Jesus and I would like to be with him forever. Is he worth being with forever? Is he worth waiting for? Is he worth it? Hi there again. Did you find that message profound? I know I did. I remember when I first heard it and it blew me away. I really wanted to know more. I wanted more answers. I wanted to discuss these things with other like-minded people that were studying the same things. Here are some questions for you to discuss in your group at home. Why do you think people are afraid of dying? How important do you think it is to understand what happens when someone dies? Would you like to know more about what happens when you die? If so, text us so that we can organise that for you at home. I would like to invite you to our next presentation that will be held tomorrow live at Devonport SDA Church at 11.30am and then we'll have another program at 2.30pm. And don't forget there will be a free lunch included. Thank you and I'll see you then.